See you, everybody. Hi. Hi, Imogen. Hope everyone's well. Hopefully it's too early for anything else. <laughs> You can have this in one second. Okay. Right, afternoon everybody. I think everybody, um, yeah, we've got people that are just waiting. Zoom software is doing ever so well, I think, considering the number of people are using it, but it's not without faults, is it? It does have its moments. Um, hopefully this will record. It says that it's recording. So what we'll be able to do is obviously upload this to YouTube later on this evening. So anyone who wants to watch the replay can do so. Um, hiya Claire, <laughs> you're right. Um, God, I look bloody dreadful. My hair appointment should have been this morning. So I'm now in sort of, you know, six weeks plus territory. It's not good, is it? It's not good at all. Yeah, th that's exactly, so I can't lift it up. I can't possibly do that. No running fingers through hair. Um, it's mm. Good situation. So what we're going to do this afternoon is spend some time with you talking about the uh, the consideration <coughs> okay uh, because for many people if you don't consider redundancy until it's too late then that will be the only option you will have um, and it's in these situations it's much better to have all of your facts on the table, all of your thoughts sort of explored now, and then you've got a range of options available to you as employers. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a presentation that I've updated in relation to where we are now and what circumstances you might need to consider redundancies now. Um, and we're going to basically talk you through, and, and a number of you, um, quite a number of you, if I've leaned down, have, have sent in some questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to address these questions as well um, and so therefore everybody who 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 has a question um, will have an opportunity for that question to be um, answered within this webinar so we'll take as long as we take I've, I've got about an hour or so um, in mind for, for this webinar um, obviously you can leave at any time some of you are already chatting I wonder if that's for me I can't hear you oh that's not good <laughs> oh, you've got me Katie, you're in your PJs. Oh, bless you. Poor thing. Um, well, then that's probably a good thing, isn't it? If you're still in your PJs. Well done. Well done. Um, um, I was up at 2.30 this morning, so it's not been a good one for me, I have to say. I'm with a helicopter overhead at 4.30, so I don't know what that was about. Um, so I've got some questions. So we'll go through the questions and we'll go through the, the slides and we'll see where we get. But if you've got a question, do add it um, into the um, the chat box um, and if you're happy for me to obviously know that it's your question um, and you'll notice that all the other questions are non anonymized so welcome everybody we've got 41 people um, on the call so we will get started now um, share my screen go to share screen and you should all now be able to see some slides with a bit of luck let's go through this presentation with you. So by the end of this webinar, um, my plan is that you've got a good understanding of what is technically meant by redundancy. And what, I've got, what I want you to understand is here's a process won't be any different um, even in this pandemic. Um, anyone who's got their mic on might like to just switch that off. Um, otherwise we'll hear every noise and crunch. Um, anyone who, any redundancy, regardless of the circumstances, business finds itself making redundancies still has to standard redundancy policy now we will have to adapt any redundancy to accommodate the fact that we may well be in lockdown and that you may well have staff who were furloughed during the consultation process so there will be an adaptation but the same principles of redundancy will apply now as they would have done say 12 months ago or six months ago so by the end of the webinar I'd like you to really understand redundancy and what it might mean for your business I also want you to understand the alternatives that exist because um, thinking about the alternatives to your redundancy is really important. It's important to think about whether you, you wish to explore those alternatives now and have those in mind before you press what we call the redundancy button. Because once it's pressed, you can't really unpress it um, and you don't want to seem as if you're not managing the process by, for your business. You want to be given the impression 
to yourself and to your staff team that you're very much in control and you're managing the process. It's not managing you. And I'd also like you to understand the steps involved in redundancy, because depending on the size of your business, there are different steps. And depending on the number of people that you need to make redundant, there are different steps. And so it's really important to understand when you might need to do certain things, given the numbers that might be involved. And that's what we're going to explore. We'll also explore the different stages and why certain things are important and how we would adapt those stages in order to achieve um, a fair redundancy, even though obviously we're not in, we're not in normal times, are we, as, as, as we'd say. So first of all, um, you should be able to now see a slide that says the five potentially fair reasons for a dismissal. So this list was reduced some years ago. We went from having six potentially fair reasons to five. And the one that was removed was retirement. So retirement is no longer a form of dismissal. Retirement is actually um, a resignation, which obviously some people are already counting the days down to their retirement um, and plans are being made what they'll do when they when they do retire. So these are the five reasons. So you can see misconduct is in there, which is being naughty. Capability, which is obviously not performing, whether because you can't do your job or because you're unwell and can't attend work regularly. You've got a statutory reason. So that might be something like there's um, we're not an, 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 um, allowed to employ you to do that job because of a, a reason that exists in law. Maybe you don't have the legal right to work in this country and we've only just discovered this and now we've got to dismiss you for a statutory reason. Um, redundancy obviously is in there number four and then my favourite SOSR some other substantial reason so if we can't make the first four fit then we rely on the fifth one and we'll typically use that in uh, childcare where perhaps um, they've been convicted of a, a criminal offence which um, doesn't come under the realms of misconduct in the workplace but we're no longer able to employ them to work with children and so therefore it's a some other substantial reason for dismissal that'd be the common reason why we'd use it in your industry so that being said there are only potentially fair reasons for dismissal so you will find that there'll be a situation that might exist where you've, you've thought that it was fair but the employee will still criticize the fairness of the dismissal and that's where you get this notion of an unfair dismissal claim. Now, most unfair dismissal claims are because somebody was dismissed for misconduct. And as you can imagine, that's often quite subjective. Um, the employee says that they did something. The employer said that they um, sorry, did something. The employee said they didn't. You've got his and her or, or them and us. Um, there's conflict. Um, there's debate about the fairness of the process followed and the debate about the, the reasonableness of the dismissal. That's quite a common reason for, for two parties to end up in a tribunal. Redundancy doesn't tend to lead to re um, uh, tribunal because obviously there's a process to go through. So it's much um, more long winded than obviously just dismissing somebody because I don't know, um, they got off with one of the other directors or something. Um, and, and believe you me, that has happened. Um, so, you know, there can be lots of reasons why a redundancy is treated by the employee as being potentially um, a much more understandable process. And what you really want is your redundancy to get caught up in other people's redundancies. And the reason why that's important is because if people find themselves redundant and then people they know have found themselves redundant, there's an understanding that perhaps it wasn't personal, this was a necessary um, need by the business, by the organisation, and hopefully by other organisations like your organisation. And it almost helps you. And we found that in 2008, 2009, when we had obviously the, the financial crash, there was a lot of redundancies there. And a lot of people's feedback was, well, I totally understand why you're making me redundant. My brother-in-law's lost his job. My sister-in-law's lost his job. It's happening all around us. And that does help you, definitely does help. So let's look at why. So there are, there are not many reasons why a redundancy occurs. Um, and, and we use in redundancy um, employment legislation words like cessation, which is not a good word um, for teeth. Um, but really what we mean is a reduction. So when we talk about the role no longer exists, then that's really useful if you've, say, got one role. And so, I don't know, let's think of a role you might have in... I think most of you in nurseries but there might be other businesses on the call but say you had a 
we're going to pick on them. Say you had a chef, okay? So chef is our role for today that we're going to talk about. I know it will come up later. So say you've got a chef. Say you no longer need a chef. Now, um, let's think of the reasons why you wouldn't need a chef. Um, say you decided to um, buy food in um, and you didn't need it prepared. Or say um, you were going to then make the children bring in um, packed lunches. So you weren't going to do any hot food cooking. You no longer needed a chef. That role is a role of one person and it can be placed at risk of redundancy because it no longer exists. You can have the closure of a place of work. So when you look at someone's contracts, they say where they work. They might have um, a mobility clause in there that says you could work at another nursery, but there's always going to be the nursery that they work at. Um, and if you decide to close that setting, then that, that could lead to redundancy of everybody who is, that's their primary place of work. That's where they go to do their work. You could have a business closure. Um, and again, many of you that have got multiple settings will have multiple limited companies for the purpose of being able to close that business and it not impact the other businesses, which is never a bad idea if you're ever thinking of opening additional settings. Um, there's the reduced need for the work that's undertaken. So you might have, I don't know, a team of six early years practitioners, but you feel that you will no longer need six um, you perhaps will not have as many children to need six and will wish to reduce it down to three. So that's a reduction in, in the need of, of the, the work that is undertaken by somebody. So that's the fourth reason. Um, what it shouldn't be is the fifth one, which is we don't like Fred. Fred's face doesn't fit. It's been time for Fred to go for some time and now we're going to press the button. So the, yeah, that's, that's what you've got to deal with, four reasons. We can't suddenly make the fifth reason fit your situation, um, unfortunately. And we do get, you know, people who do, as I say, genuinely want to use redundancy as a euphemism for moving somebody on that's not performing very well. Um, and it, you know, it, it's never easy, put it this way, it's never easy. I won't say it can't be done, but it's never easy. So let's look at some myths. Um, when somebody's redundant, they can't be reemployed. That's a myth. Um, you can be made redundant from an organisation and the organisation can then change its mind and invite somebody to return. Um, and my husband's place, this happens all the time. So people will be made redundant from their permanent full time positions and then um, he'll switch off their IT and in a few weeks time he'll be told that they've been rehired perhaps to do two days a week um, and they're going to be coming back. They've broke their service. Um, there's no um, risk of, of further redundancy payment being paid out by the firm that they're going to come back. So that does happen. Um, and there was a lot of discussion at the beginning of this month with regard to obviously um, the government's decision that people who were made redundant before furlough was announced on the 20th could then um, come back, even though they'd been made redundant. And, and obviously um, some organisations did take people back. But other organisations said, well, if we did, we would continue the service. So guess what? Any redundancy payment you've had would have to be returned to us. Um, otherwise, you can't come back as a, and be furloughed. So, you know, there's, there was discussion around that um, earlier in April. Once a role has been made redundant, you won't be able to rehire for a period of 12 months. Again, that's a myth. You have to be a genuine redundancy on the day of redundancy. So if somebody's... Um, decision to make them redundant, what we call the notice day, is a Friday. Um, what you'd expect is, is on that day of notice, if say circumstances changed on the following Monday, you would withdraw the notice of redundancy. You would say to them, happy days, we've given you notice, but we can now um, change our mind and, and offer you um, to stay. And that's, that's what notice does. When you get to the end date, the day they actually terminate, say that was a Friday, they actually finished with you, if you then had a pickup in customers the following week or you had a change in situation the following week, you wouldn't be obligated to go back to that person and say, you finished on Friday, would you like to come back? What you would be free to do is to say, we're advertising for that position now because it was genuinely redundant on the Friday. We've now got a change of circumstances, which has led to um, us needing to hire for that position again. And it does happen, always can make the redundancy a little bit more sticky because for the employee who doesn't automatically get offered to come back, they may well feel that it was redundant was because of them and not because of their post. So yeah, it does make things more challenging, but it can happen. 
Um, and another myth is that if you close a place of work and you have work elsewhere, the staff have to have those roles. Again, that's a myth because um, if you close one place of work um, and the people are based at that place of work, they don't have an automatic right to go to another place of work. But what you do do when you consult with people over their redundancy is to talk to them about ways in which you avoid a redundancy. So you might decide to reduce the number of people employed in nursery A and tell them that they could accept vacancies in nursery B. Now, you, you could consult with them about how they could go about putting their hands up to have those vacancies, but unless they're pregnant, they don't have a right to have that job. Um, and that's the difference. Sorry, unless they're on maternity leave, they don't have the right to have that job. Um, pregnancy and maternity leave, there's different rules with redundancy, but they have to be on maternity leave to actually be given the other job. You can consult and you should try and avoid a redundancy, but if it's different limited companies, you might have limited company A runs nursery A, limited company B runs nursery B. You don't have to tell people in nursery A who are at risk of redundancy about any vacancies in nursery B, but you could if you wanted to, but you wouldn't be under any obligation to do so, even if they were on maternity leave. So, the process. So the need for redundancy can occur overnight and ideally um, a business will know that a redundancy may be necessary and be able to take steps to avoid and I very much feel that that's where you guys are now is that you know that redundancy may be necessary probably because you know that the furlough scheme is March, April, May. So that's the three months the government talks about. So if you didn't furlough people until I don't know, Monday the 23rd of March, the government isn't going to extend the furlough arrangements to the 23rd of June for you. It's the 1st of March to the 1st of April, the 1st of April to the 1st of May, the 1st of May to the 1st of June. So it's going to end at the end of May, uh, unless it's extended. I think what we have read over recent days is that the take up of that scheme has been far greater than Rishi first anticipated when he announced it um, of the scheme being in existence. So there, if there's a higher take up, we've got to ask ourselves, is it likely that they can afford to extend it? Um, they've really got to balance, haven't they? Wealth and health, which is what they're doing um, as, as, um, as running the country at the moment. So if you are in that position, you know you've got to ask yourself about whether redundancies might occur in your nursery, either because the um, job retention scheme will come to an end sooner than you are back up and running, or sooner than you are back up and running and comfortable. Because um, what we have been saying this week, and I think many people have agreed, is that it's quite possible your nursery won't reopen in the same shape that it closed, um, or your uh, out of school club won't necessarily have the, the summer that you expected to have. And all these factors taken into consideration need to make your mind up as to whether, will help you make your mind up whether you need to look at redundancies and whether that's an option. But once you've pressed the redundancy button, you've jolly well pressed it. And that's what I want you to, to bear in mind. So let me just admit, Kate, is everybody with me so far? So in, in the chat, if I can have a, you know, either thumbs up bums or whatever it is you say in, in nurseries or a thumbs up on the screen, that's even better, even better. We don't need a chat. We can do it visually. Thumbs up bums. Jolly good. So everybody's good with that. Now, um, we have got, um, I think it's an image actually. Yes, we have. You should all be able to see a flow chart now. Now, as you all know, those of you that have been hanging around this group for a while, um, I am in an, uh, the lucky position of having a 16 year old computer whiz in the family. And so he has created this flow diagram for you this morning. Um, and basically, um, it's going to talk us through some of our options. So if anyone wants a flow diagram, like I've said yesterday, if anyone wants a spreadsheet, get your requests in now because I have a 16 year old who with lots of IT skills and lots of time on his hands. So do Jenna, Jen, we've still just got the presentation at the moment. Oh. I don't know whether it's underneath or you just no. shared the presentation on the screen. That's possibly what it is. So thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Let me have a look. Share. It says share screen. So if I stop share and then start share, share screen, here he is. So that 
It should be a flow chart. Yep. Brilliant. Fantastic. So if you need a flow chart, let us know and we'll run you up a flow chart. So we have got here a need for you to reduce your wage bill. You've got several options which we'll call alternatives. So one of the alternatives might be to reduce hours. Um, if, if a reduction in hours would solve a problem, then consult over reduction of hours. If you like that option, that's probably more preferable than this option, which is obviously, do you need to reduce people's pay and have them do the same hours? If you think about it, somebody who is full time might have more of an issue working for less than they would normally work for to do the same hours than would they would do if you reduce their hours and the other issue you have that doesn't necessarily happen in other businesses is you know you can only cut so far because if you ask someone to cut their hours and that's going to take them below the minimum wage you can't cut those hours um, sorry cut that pay you can cut the hours but you can't cut the pay so that option on this side of the screen might not be an option for you in the way that it might be for other businesses then you've got this idea of um, another option being, would um, volunteers help you? So what we're gonna do this afternoon is, is talk to you about the fact that you might have people for whom, and, and you might know who these people are already because of their behavior during the enforced closure and, and obviously furlough. You might have had some people, I know some people have, had people come to them and say, look, you know, don't worry about me, worry about Betty, worry about, Brenda, worry about other people. I'm okay. Do what you need to do with me. If you need to put me on mill pay and, and lay me off, that's absolutely fine. Now, these might be people that, again, would be quite happy to volunteer if their volunteering saves someone else's position. So, again, having a voluntary scheme when you've got a little bit of time always to says, uh, says a lot about your values as a business and how you treat people. When we're pushed up against it and we've got no time, which we would have been in that situation if we hadn't have had furlough, uh, we'd have been up against it really quickly and having to make very quick decisions. In those circumstances, you can't do a voluntary scheme because you haven't got the space to do so. But if you've got time, a voluntary scheme can really help. And you don't need to enhance it very much for people to put their hand up and say, I think I'd like to volunteer. So that would be something definitely to consider. Um, I love the way that a 16 year old has suggested that if you do don't need to reduce your wage bill, that it's happy days and um, only a 16 year old would describe not needing to reduce the wage bill as happy days. So I'm going to go back now to the presentation. So learning what I did wrong there. Let's go back. Oh, don't end for all otherwise. That's not going to be good. OK, stop share. And then we will share screen, go back to the presentation. Get rid of that and share. So you should be back with a presentation with me. So these are our alternatives. So strategies that can evolve and involve avoiding a redundancy, increasing your sales, so offering something you've not previously offered, putting your costs up, putting your rates up. Um, I've known people sort of look to see if they could uh, use their space differently, um, could they um, look at ways in which they could increase their service over seven days. And I think that's probably going to become a thing, isn't it? I think more of a seven days early year centres will spring up to, to serve um, the NHS and to other sectors will, will spring up as a, as a consequence of this because people have started doing it now for the first time and that will probably encourage people to say well we, we managed to manage it this time maybe we could manage it in the future. Um, one of the options I said is cutting hours another is cutting wages. Um, if you do have people who there is some space between them there is a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a gap between their hourly rate and the minimum wage then cutting wages could be a possibility. But for all the reasons we've just discussed, that might not be as acceptable to your workforce as cutting hours. Then you've got obviously restructuring. And one of the ways in which we might restructure would be to not replace roles um, that of people have left that you would normally replace. Um, if people have left you at the beginning of this process, you might then say, well, OK, we won't be looking to have those people back. You might um, change from having people 
um, engaged who, who were perhaps doing quite a lot of hours for you as, as flexible workers, as, as, as casual labour, doing a lot less for you and, and, and keeping your costs down that way. You could cut other costs, you could change your suppliers, you could obviously move to Red Wing and have your HR sorted that by us. Um, there's lots of ways in which you can obviously reduce your costs. Um, things like photocopiers, um, I've known people look at contracts they've got with gardening people and maintenance and saying, look, we know we can't afford to do that now, we'll need to look at a different way of doing it um, to maintain our building and, and our facilities. Um, asking for volunteers is on there because as an alternative to a redundancy that's compulsory, it's very attractive, but it is still a redundancy technically. When somebody um, says yes to go into for, to, to, from your organisation as a volunteer, they're saying yes to being made dismissed. They're still, it's still treated in law as a dismissal, even though they volunteered to be dismissed. So here are our steps. The first thing you need to do is decide which of the four that we talked about in that slide a few minutes ago is the reason for your redundancy. And then we write what's called the paragraph. Now in 2008, 2009, when we did a lot of redundancies because of the, um, the downturn, the sentence was the paragraph, it was due to the economic downturn, your role is at risk of redundancy. There wasn't a great deal to it. And it may well be that you know, due to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, will become the new sentence that replaces the one we used in 2008-2009. Um, you've just got to have your reason why the, a redundancy is, is used um, in this instance and then you refer back to that sentence again and again and again. Um, if you change your tune, shall we say, as to why this redundancy is occurring, you create doubt in the mind of the employee and you'll destabilise the whole process. So you have to create your decision of what it is, create your decision of, of why it is, and stick to that throughout the process. You will identify those who are affected. So you might need to discuss with your, um, with your colleagues, with your management team, um, where could we, where do we need to affect a redundancy? Which parts of the, of the business need to be impacted? Um, and then you will identify whether you've got pools of people, um, say that you want to reduce your nursery practitioners from six to three, or whether you wish to remove roles. And I said, we'll, we'll pick on chef again as being the role of one. Then you'll identify who you'll need to consult with. So obviously if chef is a role of one, you'll be consulting with one chef. If you've got six early years practitioners employed and you wish to reduce that down to three, you'll be consulting initially with all six and then latterly with the three that you identify at high risk. So if you imagine you've got a pool of six, or a pool of one in the examples we've just given. You'll identify what form the redundancy will take, um, which is obviously the roles um, reduction or role removal, um, which is what we've just been discussing. You can have a pool of one, which we've just described, or a pool of many. But it's identifying that who's in that pool is really important because what you don't want is to find out that somebody was in the pool later. So you can have this, say if you've got early years practitioners, and then you've got some people who are described as nursery assistants. That's quite distinct. But what if somebody is described as an early years practitioner in reality, but in their contract, they're described as a nursery assistant. You might miss them from the pool. Um, and then that can be awkward and difficult to add them back in. You don't want people to argue with you about what their job is within the nursery. So say you've decided all the unqualified are at risk of redundancy. You don't want someone to turn and say, but as you know, I just got my qualification. So what's my status? You want it to be you know, very clear as to who's in your pool and why they're in it. This is going to be really important and more important than when we normally talk about redundancies because the numbers do tell a story. So if you are looking at making up to 19 people redundant, we can follow a process that's quite straightforward. Once over 20 um, are the number, then it is much more detailed and much more difficult because we need to consult collectively and we have to do so 30 days before any dismissals take place. Normally, that wouldn't be a conversation we'd have with nurseries. I can't, you know, we don't often talk about redundancies of more than 20 people in a nursery. But in reality, if you have a limited company and you've got 100 staff and you decide that 20% of your staff aren't needed, you could easily get to the 20 figure and end up in a situation where you've got to start thinking about redundancies for the end of May in the next 10 days. So 
um, the, the number that's banding around at the moment is um, quite important. Um, businesses that might need to make 100 or more redundancies have, I think, until Saturday um, to start consultation if they're going to give um, dismissals by the end of um, May, May, which is when obviously the furlough arrangements cease to exist to our knowledge. Now, you would want to do consultation even if you didn't know when the government was going to, or if the government was going to be able to extend furlough, because you couldn't possibly wait for the cabinet to make their decision before you then press the button on your redundancy consultation process, because you'll have left it too late. So um, anyone who knows of any larger firms who might need to make redundancies will be starting their consultation by Saturday. And you have to elect reps, which is what this slide talks about. Um, if you don't have a trade union, you have to obviously identify reps um, and go through a process of nominating people that, that would be employee reps that you would then consult with. Um, and again, collective consultation is different to consulting with people as individuals because you then sit around a table and talk to a small group of people, um, which can make it obviously um, much more, what's the word, um, doable given the numbers involved. It's very difficult to consult individually with more than 20 people, as you can imagine. The problem with society now is we all want to be treated as individuals, so it can make it very, very challenging, shall we say. Um, you end up doing it twice, you end up consulting with the rep and then consulting with the individual who then comes on the phone afterwards. Um, consultation is meaningful and genuine, and that's what it, those are the two words that we completely bang on about. If you're going to do a redundancy and do it fairly, your consultation has got to feel genuine, be genuine, sound genuine. You can't do it just because it's something you're told to do. You've got to do it because you genuinely want to avoid a redundancy. Um, in a small under 20 um, environment where there's less than 20 people going, it'll take weeks, not months. Um, and, you know, we as HR consultants hold our clients' hands through the entire process from the day that we press the button to the day that the last person finishes. Um, and how you do your redundancy depends on so the proposed redundancy and, and obviously how long it will take would depend on the number of um, redundancy and people who will be at risk of redundant, which is what we've already just said. These are the terms you need to really much hold dear to yourselves, which is obviously that everything until it happens are either potential or possible or proposed. And I find this is where employers most um, fall foul of, of, of themselves, really. They'll start to talk about the redundancy or the role being redundant rather than that risk. Um, and if you keep to being until you've been made redundant, until I've issued you with a letter of notice, you are potentially going to be redundant, possibly going to be made redundant. It's a proposal that these roles will be redundant then it hasn't actually happened yet. What you don't want to do is to give the impression that it's a done deal and that you're just going through these days and going through these steps to play lip service to legislation rather than try and avoid a redundancy. And as I say, it can happen that you've given notice and then a week later you're in a position to say, happy days, I don't need you to serve the rest of your notice, I now need you to stay because I've, I've managed to avoid a redundancy, I've got a role for you. Um, so it does and it will happen and things do change. I mean, you know, does any of us really know how nurseries are going to be impacted by all of this? Um, I was reading, I was sipping my coffee, some people were saying the other day that they thought that a lot of schools might lose children to homeschooling because despite popular belief, some parents and children are loving it <laughs> so some people might not return to school full-time um, in September because they've chosen to home school their children would the same apply to parents well I think flexible working requests are going to go through the ceiling and I think a lot of people are going to look to work from home um, and they're going to go well I've proved it can work at short notice so why can't I do it permanently that might mean that people want to reduce their nursery day they might want one need to leave um, their child with you at 8am for a 45 minute commute into Birmingham. I don't know why I chose Birmingham. You couldn't do 45 minutes into Birmingham from here at eight o'clock in the morning, to be fair, about an hour and a half. Um, but, you know, you've, you've got that situation where well, I'm not going to do the commute anymore. I won't need nursery from 8am. I'd rather have nursery from nine. So people might be coming back to you and saying, I want to reduce my hours, I want to reduce my days, I'm going to work from home one day a week, I won't need childcare that day. 
there's going to be lots of things that are going to be different. So will we really know what you're going to reopen and what it's going to look like without you needing to perhaps talk to people about changing their, their um, relationship with you? Um, we just don't know, but I think it's highly possible you're going to want to have a chat with people about that you would anticipate less need than you've got now. Letters. Well, letters are needed between the employer and the employees who are at risk. We start off obviously telling people that they um, break in the bad news, we call it. Bad news is you're going to get a letter, you, your role is at risk of redundancy and we do need to sit down with you formally. Then you get obviously the letter that says, you know, this is the, the letter to talk to you about the meeting that we're going to have. Um, and obviously always take advice about those letters, never sort of uh, borrow one that you've had previously and use it for you. Make sure that it always fits your situation. And, and I think it's really important that the tone of the letter is very clear. And, and especially in these times where you're going to be reliant on written communication, replacing what you would normally do face to face. So what we would normally do face to face when we bring people in for a chat is, you know, often reassuring them that, you know, it does look like we're going to need to use a selection criteria, which will be fair and drawn up and will include things like length of service. And you're looking at the person who's got very long service to say, obviously, that means we're not going to want to let get rid of you. And um, you won't be able to do that in a letter as easily. So the skill will be to make sure there's a tone to that communication that doesn't put the cat amongst the pigeons where it doesn't need to be, but equally where people feel that you're trying very hard to communicate with them fairly and reasonably and decently, because that's all that really matters, isn't it? When it comes to notice, whether someone works their notice or not will depend on the contract of employment. So you may well have in your contracts um, talk of pylon and garden leave. Now, garden leave would suggest that obviously somebody could serve their notice from home, um, which, which, which might be suitable to you. Pylon would mean that obviously you'd be able to pay in lieu, which means rather than give somebody notice, they would, their employment would end and you would pay them the equivalent. Um, if we, you do your redundancies um, at the right time for you and your nursery within this period of furlough, um, it may well be that people are on notice of redundancy what, see, whilst furloughed. Um, and that would mean, um, in, our, in our view, that that person would be entitled to receive the same notice pay as they would have done if they would have been at home. So like we're advising for holiday, you'd probably need to top that notice pay up to 100% because why would an employee receive less pay when on notice of redundancy than they would have done if they were in work or not working and on garden leave? The pylon obviously again is a different matter but again pylon wouldn't take advantage of any furlough so possibly not something you would want to do unless you had to depending on the timing of your redundancy. And what happens after redundancy? Well after redundancy has been issued um, so as you've served notice the employee's got the right to time off anyway for job search. Now obviously if they were furloughed that time off for job search would be fairly unlimited really Time off a job search in law is two fifths of a week. So if somebody does two days a week, um, sorry, does five days a week, they could have up to two days when they were able to go for interviews. If they were furloughed, then clearly they could use a lot more time for their job search. And that would probably be very desirable to them to do so. Um, those who obviously are back at work um, and it was two fifths, you would work that out based on obviously what they were um, contracted to work, not what they were actually working. Um, in terms of obviously employers, it's a good idea if you can do as much as you can to support your employees. So any CV writing, interview skills, techniques and job search and that sort of thing. Anything you can help people with, the better. Um, and again, your local authority um, might be able to help and assist. Large numbers are going to impact local communities. So, you know, people, once they start finding out and, and there's forms and things we have to fill in to tell people in, in the community, large scale redundancies are happening. They, they tend to do something to help. Now, you know, what I think won't happen will be that there will be a desire to support, um, say, chains of nurseries with, with assistance, because in society, there'll be that many people made redundant. How can they decide who to help and who not? Um, but, you know, you can obviously do as much as you can. The way you treat people in a redundancy, I think, tells 
other people volumes about how you are as an employer. And remember, what you don't want to do is to cause yourself irreparable damage as to your brand and how you are treated in society. So if you aren't, don't handle this right and people don't feel well looked after, they'll tell 50 other people, you'll tell 50 other people and your, your word will get around quickly that you didn't look after people, you didn't do it very well. So you do want to have you know, the sort of redundancy that means that people won't be slagging you off in the pub and they will be still doing their bit to perhaps either try and get back to work with you or to tell others that you were a decent employer to work for and sadly circumstances meant that you could no longer be employed so you know we do know there is a recruitment crisis in day nurseries i do think it might get a bit easier after all of this but i do think it'll be a challenge if we do need to make redundancies to stop ourselves being again unpopular um, with 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 nursery workers who feel that well if we took a job with them we might not stay so that would hopefully um cover what i wanted you to know a little bit about working with us if that's what you might want to do so let's go through some of these questions and um, let's first of all see whether you've got questions so if i stop sharing do 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 so that should go back um and then chat oh dear where are we going with this tech hey so let's let julie in 47 of you that's not bad is it for a thursday afternoon so where do the chaps sit then hmm? ah there we go okay so diane's got a question remember a staff who left mid-march and i took her back to furlough her she comes up to two years service next month so once we reopen i will need to make her redundant so she can return to her new job, I think that will probably say. Oh, Diane, we'll answer that um, separately, I think, um, in terms of obviously you've gone back to somebody and you've offered them their job back. Um, it's, ah, oh, yes, I mean, that's the worst case scenario, isn't it? That somebody you've had back will now get to two years service. Um, what I'm really keen on knowing, Diane, and you might be able to tell me in the chat, is did they leave because um, they resigned or did they leave because you um, finished them? I think that will make a difference to the advice that I'll give on that one. But um, So we'll come back to that. Um, and what have we got? Do, do, do. Yeah, that's all good. Thumbs up, bums. Yes, that was all a bit there. Um, no flow chart. Yeah, we sorted that bit out. Yeah, I couldn't see the flow chart. It wasn't that great, but it was pretty good. As I say, I'm loving the fact that he thinks that it's um, happy days. Volunteers being qualified teachers who are still on full pay from the government, but only on a massively reduced timetable. Um, so yeah, if you if you if you if you're a school and you've got um, teachers in to look after the children of key workers. Um, Enabling early years nursery to open their doors again, helping our staff issues and payroll. What's going to cut? What's going to cost the government? Nothing. Oh yes, I think you're right, Katie. I think it is difficult to say. Is thirty days the minimum length of consultation period? Yes, in it is. If you've got over twenty people being made redundant, under up to nineteen, there is no um, stipulated period of consultation. And we often talk about what's called a ten day process, um, which is a reasonable amount of time. So. If you're under 19, then you won't need to worry. Um, if they're under two years service, yeah, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, you'll still need to go through a process, Katie, but the process is going to be um, much less risky um, in terms of obviously your adherence to that process. But you would want to treat everybody the same because, you know, we keep telling everybody this. Just because they've got two years service doesn't mean to say that they are without employment rights. They'll turn around and say it's discriminatory. They'll turn around and say it's for a protected characteristic. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, if you consult with an employee whilst they're on furlough, are they working? No, we believe you will be able to consult with an employee whilst on furlough and it won't be treated as working. It will just be communication. Um, and so that will be, um, you know, 
what businesses will have to do. It's going to be a grey area, um, but you're going to have to modify your communication method. And that's why you're going to be relying on letters rather than what we would typically do face to face. Um, it's probably certain I'll need to make some staff redundant. Is it strictly last in, first out? Now, there's no such thing as LIFO, which is first in, first, last in, first out. Um, you have to have a selection criteria in redundancy that is based on many factors. Service will be one of them, but other factors are important as well. If you just had one factor of service, then you would be alleged that you are being age discriminatory because it's much harder for a younger worker to have the service that an older worker can achieve. So we don't recommend LIFO, LIFO or, or last in first out. What we do recommend is you're thinking about qualifications, about experience, about people's undertaking of courses, um, and, and things that you can objectively say, that is that person. And what I always like to say with these things is that when you do a selection criteria and you come up with it, and you then test it to see if it gives you the result you want it to achieve, what you want to be able to say is, you know, if my mum was to sit down and look at your evidence, she would come to the same conclusion as you have. You know, if she if you've said that somebody's absence is this, she would be able to see the evidence that says, oh, yes, I can see why you've given that person a two. They have had five days absence in the last 12 months. I can see the evidence of it. So you want something that's so undeniable that people can't turn around and say, what do you mean? I've got three qualifications and that person's got two. Um, you know, you want it to be absolutely well. That's what the evidence says. That's what we've got on file. Um, resigned. She resigned. OK, so she resigned and came back. OK, that's interesting, Diane. We will come back to you about that one. How do we work out how much redundancy pay? OK, so redundancy pay is all done by the government calculator, Catherine. So you just go to gov.uk and um, put into the search bar statutory redundancy and you'll come up with a calculator. It's linked to service. So if an employee who is nine years um, service, don't worry about the fact they're on bank staff. If they've got regular income from yourself, they can still be at risk of redundancy um, at this stage. But it would depend on their age, Catherine. If they're an older person over 41, that it's one and a half weeks for every year of service. If they're under 41, so over 22 and under 41, then it's one week. Um, so the age discrimination really kicks in when it comes to redundancy payments. And remember, you only have redundancy payment if you've got two years or more service um, and it's only in four years. So if you're three and a half years, three years counts. You don't get anything more for half years or, or parts of years that have been followed. Um, so, yeah, it, go onto the government website. If you get stuck, do send us a message and we'll help you out. From the process, is the process the same? For an apprentice who's less than two years service, it, it would be a process, Jenny, um, because that apprentice deserves for you to treat them fairly. And an apprentice would have the protected characteristic of probably being a younger person. So age discrimination would be a risk. So I'd want you to follow a process. And apprentices are often in many industries considered to be untouchable in a, in a redundancy. You don't make your apprentices redundant. Um, in your industry, you might need to make your apprentice redundant because you're no longer capable of delivering their learning. So, you know, it's a process that would still need to happen. And I would be being careful with, with if I was removing one apprentice because of age discrimination. So regards to when you furlough the staff, it all currently comes at stop. Yes, that's right. End of May. Yet yeah, there's no suggestion that the dates um, are three months from the date you furloughed. Nothing I've read says that. An employee who is coming up to two years service on the 5th of May, I don't want her to lose her furlough money. No, not necessarily, because again, you know, you, you don't need to fear her having two years service. Um, but you, you and, and you know, depending on what your notice period between her and you might be, um, it may already be too late because if, you, if you've got a month's notice in your contracts for your staff, she's already going to have um, the, the, the service for a claim as of today, as of the 16th of April. So, you know, it, it, it let's, don't let dates of, of, of employment get in the way of obviously your, your thought process. If they were less than two years, they would be perhaps somebody you wouldn't have furloughed in the first place if you were gonna just, um, if you like, um, you know, jettison them off somewhere. Um, we may be in the position we need to return from staff from furlough in the hope we have a reasonable number of children gradually return May not happen. Is there a best way to return staff from furlough? But with this, 
Oh, I hate chat on Zoom. It really isn't very easy to use. Do, 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 do. No, it doesn't. That's right. Um, well, the best way to return stuff from furlough but with this in mind, approach them to change their contract. Yeah, absolutely. This is what we mean about talk about things now and decide now, because it may well be that you need to obviously, you know, press the, the button on terms of seeking volunteers or talking to people about reducing their hours on your return before you do so. So let's take this idea that we're not talking about redundancies per se, but as an alternative. If you want to cut someone's hours, you do not have the right to do that in your contract. Even a variation clause doesn't have you the right to make them agree. It'll have, because it will have an impact on their wages if you cut their, um, their hours. But you can have, obviously ask them and you could potentially serve notice on that contract. Um, and, and again, it gets really complicated. It's probably more complicated to forcibly change somebody from doing 30 hours to 20 hours than it is to make them redundant. But um, you know, in a snapshot, you have to follow a process, you have to talk to them, you try and get their agreement. Now, you know, many people might say, I'd rather have 20 hours for the next three months and then go back up to 30 hours than have no work for the next three months. So you'll be amazed at what people do agree to do. So what I'm going to do now is I could, I could probably scroll through the chat for, for another um, 10 minutes or so, but I want to go through these questions with you and hopefully that will answer some of your questions as well. So um, my first question is from a lady called Shaz. Um, so Shaz wants to know that um, it, does she enter into discussions regarding a redundancy? Does she have to take them off furlough and pay them a full week's pay? No, we don't believe you do need to um, unfurlough your staff to start consulting with them regarding a possible redundancy um, because it's just communication. Um, and obviously she's then saying, you know, would their notice period be at their 80% or at the 100%? It would be 100% because for a redundancy, it's the contract of employment says that you're entitled for, to X amount of notice between the employer and the employee. It's typically a week for every year of service, but some of you will have contracts that give a month after the probationary period or the same as the employees give you, they'll have been matched. So always look at your contract. Um, and so therefore that has to be paid at what they would normally receive. That's Shaz. Uh, Tonya. Um, so Tonya's asking about, she has um, two settings. She's in one of her settings, she's got two deputy managers, one working 20 hour, 24 hours um, and one working 44 hours. So obviously a big difference between the two. She's thinking of making the part-time deputy position redundant. Now then, do you all remember, I tell you that you've got to be frightened of the bump, don't I? So the pregnant one's got more rights than everybody else. Now, the pregnant one that's part time has got so many more rights, we can't even cover them. So part timers have got more rights than, than regular full timers. I know it sounds perverse, but it's true because there is part time, less favourable treatment regulations that protect a part timer. So for Tonya to pick on the part timer would be a really risky strategy to do. What she would need to do would be to put both roles at risk of redundancy um, and, and then have two vacancies, probably um, that she, that, sorry, one vacancy rather than two. So she'd put both roles at risk of redundancy and probably have one vacancy for 40 hours. And then she would obviously think that she would do the difference herself as the owner of so it wouldn't be a question of just targeting the part-timer. She'd have to target both roles because they're both deputy managers and then have one vacancy that they can both apply for that's 40 hours. So that's what she would have to do. Um, she might also have a vacancy for some other position and that's great. So anyone who's at risk of redundancy gets to hear about all of your vacancies that you have. So in that situation, Tonya, if you've got other vacancies, you'd be saying to the people you've placed at risk, We've got one vacancy for 40 hours, but we've also got another vacancy for, for this or another vacancy for that so that people can choose whether they wish to apply for the vacancies or to um, prefer to be redundant. So that answers Tonya's question. Betty's question, I'm hoping to partially open in the middle of May. However, I have to be realistic that not all of my children will ever return. How can I control staff's expectations of returning to how it was should I reduce everyone's days or hours first or just take the plunge and make redundancies? Really good question, Betty. 
Now, my advice to you would be, yes, to communicate expectations as soon as possible. Once staff know that you're thinking that you may need to consider redundancies, and remember I use the word consider, potential, possible, proposed, then they might start raising their hands and saying, look, I'd be happy to go, Betty. So yes, I would manage expectations. I wouldn't be um, keen on any business, whatever sector they're in, giving people the impression that everything's hunky-dory, because it, it isn't. Um, so yeah, I would be saying to people that perhaps you're looking for volunteers to make flexible working requests. Again, if Betty does that now, if she says, does anybody wish to reduce their hours when we reopen? She's going to get willing and, and, and keen people coming forward saying, well, I've wanted to cut my hours for some time and, you know, I'd like to cut my hours, maybe only for the next six months, but could I do that? Could that be an option? Now, Betty's got the flexibility to say, yeah, for the next six months, you can reduce your hours. That's absolutely fine. Would it change that person's substantive role? No. And if they were then latterly made redundant in the future, it would be their substantive hours that you based any calculations on. But you could save the money in the short term. So it would be a good idea to get people to volunteer for flexible working requests that they otherwise think that they wouldn't have a, a hope in hell's chance of getting agreed to. Um, this one is from Katie. So, um, buh, 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 buh. we may be in a position that we return some staff from furlough in the hope we have a reasonable number of children returning. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, with furlough, you can rotate so you can get the staff off furlough, protect that three weeks of your claim, obviously, because that's going to be important to you. Um, but, you know, in terms of bringing people back, do you then want to reduce their hours when you do that or lay them off? Um, I would say that, you know, you can go from furlough to redundancy. Would you want to go from furlough to layoff or short time? Possibly, but I think you're going to get pushback because whilst furlough still exists, the employees will expect the firm to potentially continue to furlough. Remember, in employees' mind, furlough costs you nothing. You get 80% of it back. So they don't have a perception of cash flow and how you actually fund a furlough arrangement. Um, so I think people would probably, unless you had, you know, no choice, they would prefer to you to continue to being furloughed and why not? So if you're going to go from furlough to redundancy, well, that will happen because the job just can't wait. To furlough to layoff is going to be less common. Without knowing the government's furlough scheme may end, we don't know if it will continue. Um, would I be able to carry on furloughing them but on a lower percentage? Well, you won't call it furlough when the job retention scheme ends, but you would obviously be able to agree to people being... Um, you know, uh, having a, a pay cut um, and, and potentially not working, or you could agree for them to have work less hours and have a pay cut. That's fine as well. Um, you could obviously get them to agree to sit at home, but they're not likely to want to sit at home um, on less hours, um, unless obviously that they really, really want to help you out here. Um, because obviously if you do, in normal circumstances, not get allowed to go to work, your employer has to pay full pay. Um, again, all depends on your contract, whether you've got layoff in there that's, that's often uh, used to make sure that people do agree to furlough because layoff is less attractive because it's um, less financially beneficial to people. Can we generally return any staff from furlough with a changed contract? Um, you, you can obviously have people coming back. Would I want to um, talk to them about obviously their hours before they return? Probably if I needed to reduce them, yes. If I didn't, I'd have them back as they left and then obviously consult with them about what you need to do in the future. But if you're going to ask people to return to work and do less hours, what you might find is people say, well, I don't want to return to work. I want to stay on my hours that I'm on and, and stay being furloughed because um, there's no incentive for them to agree to come back to work if they're not going to get the same money as they would do at home. This question's from Connor. Um, in one of my settings, Oh, no, it's the same one, Connor. That's the same one. Um, if they worked for me for less than two years, um, can I just advise them I don't have enough work to do? No, because of, of the risk of uh, protected characteristics. So always go through a process um, is, would be our advice. Someone who's been given a contract to start on the 23rd of March, but we closed on the 20th. Do they still need to be made redundant? they actually haven't started with you, have they? So obviously that's something for us to discuss, Fiona. Um, two settings, if I'm going to make redundancies, am I allowed to separate the two settings and put them all in the same pool? Again, that would depend, Fiona, on your um, contracts of employment 
um, and obviously what's going on with whether it's one limited company or two. Um, but if they've got contracts saying they work at nursery A, then that's the nursery you need to make redundancies. Then obviously the expectation is that they would be offered any, um, talk about any vacancies within nursery A, but it doesn't mean to say you're going to have a pool. Nurseries, the, the, vac the redundancies will happen at that nursery, not necessarily at the other nursery. So you can have a situation. Straight from furlough to redundant, do I have to bring them back? We've already talked about that, that you will be able to consult with people whilst they are furloughed. Um, and that's probably going to be important. And then finally, we've got Tina. Um, she's again got a cook, um, possible redundancy situation with a cook. They're partially open at the moment and the children have started to bring in lunches, which we're liking. And would we be able to consider this position to be redundant? Well, if your cook does eight till four, then it may well be that what you first do as an initial thing is to offer her a role of a dinner lady, because you'll probably need that um, as an alternative to redundancy. And she may or may not go for that. Um, but if she doesn't go for it, then obviously that will be a redundancy. You're saying here that she started two years ago, so she's clearly going to get a redundancy payment. She might be quite keen on a redundancy payment than returning or staying with you as a dinner lady. Um, she also employs a teacher. Um, she thinks in September the numbers will drop. Um, so you probably want to consult with her regarding um, her role being at risk of redundancy at the end of August. Um, if they do have an underlying health condition, again, I'd want to make sure that you properly consult over a proper period of time. Anyone who's self-isolating because they have that letter um, from the NHS saying that they should self-isolate, they but that's 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 tantamount to a protected characteristic in my book. You're going to need to be very, very careful because often they've got letters because they're technically considered disabled in law um, from an employment perspective. So do be very, very careful of that. We do know that being disabled and working is very common, even though I don't think the government always realises that. Um, they definitely didn't think that we had people over 70 in jobs, did they? Um, and we soon put them straight on that. Um, and then obviously she's asking about holidays as well as Tina. And, you know, I think I've probably talked enough about holidays over on the Facebook group. Um, we still have got no guidance. We had guidance came out again yesterday afternoon. No mention of holiday by the dear old HMRC. Um, we can only imagine that they haven't even given it any thought whatsoever. I think the, the problem we will have is that um, some businesses aren't paying holiday pay at 100% when they make their staff take holiday. I think that's the only way you can do it. Um, I think you probably will be able to justify the fact that you are only topping up to 100% because the guidance from the ACAS does say that you can be on holiday whilst furloughed. Um, We've got to do the best we can, haven't we, really? Because we can't wait for the government to come up with an answer. We might have to let people have holidays before the government answers that question. Right, so um, anyone who wants to ask a question before we leave, you can unmute yourself and ask away. I can't be doing with this chat thing. It's just too bloody difficult to scroll through the questions. Um, so yeah, anyone who's got a question who wants to, to open up their... Is that Hi. Diane opening up your mic? Is that you, yeah. Diane? Yeah, can I ask you about my lady who's going to be... Um, you're an eager beaver, so yours was the first question, wasn't it? Yeah. So your lady um, has, has left you and come back to you? Yes, so she left She left on the 20th of March to for another job, all very amicable. Um, obviously, the, a new job couldn't furlough her, so I offered to take her back. And then yeah. realised, while she's on furlough, she'll go, she'll go over the two-year... Right. Mark. Okay. Have you have you what sort of written communication has there been between you and her? While she's on furlough. Yeah. Just the furlough agreement. Just the furlough agreement. Okay. I'd be tempted to write to her again, Diane, and make sure that it's clear that you know that she knows when she's finishing, um, and that the reason for the finishing will be because obviously you had her back only to be able to furlough her to to help her out, and that there isn't yeah. a role for her after this date. Um, right and get her to agree to that because she ultimately resigned so you're just what you're doing is giving a more notice period to resign but you don't want that to turn into a dismissal so you're going to want the paperwork to fit the story okay so it still needs to be her that's leaving and not me making her redundant is that what you're saying okay i would say so yeah and you definitely want the paperwork to say that my love yeah yeah okay thank you that's great All right. can't get rid of diane can we um <laughs> Oh, the beauty bits. So, anyone else have a question? Yeah, Alison has. 
are you Alison? I uh, if I've got two people that I took on in September last year and their contract ends on the 30th of July this year yeah so they're fixed term I, contracts yeah yeah can I just it doesn't actually say in the contract that it's fixed term but it does say a, an end date can I let them go? Can you see my face? I can see you yeah yeah can you see the fact that I'm pulling one? Yeah <laughs> You don't want a fixed term contract that doesn't say in the contract that it's fixed term. Because how well, you're going to you're going to rely on the fact that they know that they've got a start date and an end date. Right. And that I mean, if you ever have a contract that isn't clear, you don't want it to be a fixed term contract that's not clear. You want it to okay. be ever crystal clear to both parties that when they signed it last September, they knew they yeah. were working on 31st of July. Right. So I might need to see that contract to be able to advise you on it. OK. But yeah, I mean, technically, what you do is just let that contract um, come to an Expire. end. Expire. By telling them that it is going to come to an end and you're not going to be able to renew or extend. OK. You don't want there to be any doubt. And that's where okay. it's really scary, really hairy, because if, if, you've, if, if, it's not, if it's not really crystal clear on paper that it's a fixed term contract, they'll argue that it's a dismissal. OK, so in that case, I could then call them in the redundancy bucket... You could, but again, you'd try and avoid so if the, if the contract allowed you to. Um, you'd try and avoid them being in the redundancy bucket. I think I'd probably still call it, you know, it's some of the substantial reason I'm finishing the fixed term contract. It's just it wasn't necessarily that clear. Um, but you'd like it to be an SOSR rather than a redundancy. Um, whilst they don't get any more money for redundancy, um, they, they, they'll, they'll want to know why they've finished with you. So you want to be clear with them that it was finishing because it was always going to finish. Um, and just hope that, that that's sufficient for everybody. They won't have the two year service. They can't claim that it's unfair, the dismissal, but mm -hmm. you want it to be you know, an issue, as I say, for a protected characteristic. Okay, because I think it was always a kind of bit of a gray area because depending on whether we've got enough staff for, uh, enough children for them, the following year and, would and determine and, whether they were kept on or not. Yeah, it, it is a really common reason for having people on fixed term um, that you know, it's to do with funding and it's to do with numbers. Um, but you really want, I mean, I would, I would say it's the sort of contract that has to be really crystal clear. So often if, say, that somebody's been brought in to cover maternity leave, their fixed term contract will say, fixed term contract, Yeah. first yeah. practitioner, brackets, maternity leave for Betty Smith. It's so bloody obvious then. Yes, we have, we have done that. Back. I don't think this one says that. I think it yeah. just says... You definitely would want that, Alison. If it doesn't, we can look at it for you and tell you what your options are, but you definitely would want that because it's just such a... It's, such, it's so much easier for you to say to somebody, the fixed term contract's coming to an end, rather yeah. than say, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Anyone else with a question? Can I ask another one? Can I ask another one? Oh. Diane, can we have someone else first? Yes, of course. I've got a quick question, if that's okay. Hello, Olivia. Hi. Um, so what if you um, look at making redundancies and it's narrowed down to two people that are pretty equal in terms of scoring and criteria? How would you then choose between those two people? Well, you, you can often have a, a selection criteria of, say, six points. And um, when it comes to the scoring, it's down to one point between two people. Um, and that's, that's quite common. I've had that happen to me a few times. When you then consult with the people, you take obviously their names off the, um, the, the spreadsheet and you just say, these are the scores. And, and, you know, obviously you can see that there wasn't much between you, but we've decided that you're at risk of redundancy. People will either get that and say, yeah, absolutely understand. I'm lacking in one qualification or I have less service or I have less experience. That's fine. Or they'll argue with you to the cows come home that it's not fair and that you should have given them more points for something else that you decided not to score them on. Um, but yeah, if you need to lose two people and it's between two people and there's only one point between them, then it's fine. Um, it can get really, really scary when you've got, you want to lose um, one person and everyone's on the same score. Then you have to look for other, other ways of which determining between who goes and who stays. Um, and that's when we might weight something like length of service or experience because we know that that's going to be useful to you going forward and we'll put a weighting on that and that might give you a better result okay cool. remember with the um selection criteria you draw it up before you tend to use it so you apply it and see what it result it gives you if it doesn't give you a clear result then you you change that criteria before you go and use it right okay yeah that that makes sense you can't cater the criteria to 
yeah, yeah. You uphold the values of it being largely objective criteria which is what we must uphold but you know you clearly need to test it to make sure that when you score it it doesn't give you that crappy situation of having everyone on the same score which gives you no value at all you know okay. yeah that's great thank you next question can i ask hello. a question hello is that oh yeah katie how are you oh, not katie <laughs> katie <laughs> <Sorry. Harry. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, so I had a member of staff that resigned um, and was due to finish uh, at the end of the spring term. I extended her resignation, obviously before all of this happened, based on the fact I wanted her to see out the academic year. Um, I just wanted to find out, obviously now I've got a downturn of work because I'm not open now and I've closed, where I stand. Can I give her notice? Potentially, or, yeah, potentially. She resigned. Well, potentially you can you 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 can talk to her, can't you? A, she she resigned because um, she wanted to leave, and you asked her to extend her notice period. She might say to you, "Yes, I'll happily go, but I want the notice period that we've agreed. So I want to be paid until the end of July." You might decide, "Well, that's no good for me. I'd rather you you um, you you left under my terms, not under yours." In that case, so your contract would need to be looked at to see what notice you would have to give her to bring that contract to right. Her. Um, and obviously, again, you've got to be mindful of discrimination and other factors if it's under two years. OK, yeah, she's over two years. So, yeah. OK. All right. That's great. Thanks, Imogen. Probably be a redundancy then, Katie. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. OK. All right, then. That's great. Thank you, Imogen. Anyone else? Um, I yeah, have a quick question. Right. Who was that then? <laughs> uh, Jenny. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. Hello there. Um, talking about criteria for uh, redundancy, you've talked about sort of qualifications and absences and things like that. Using previous supervisions and appraisals, are you allowed to use performance as one of those criteria? If everyone had an appraisal, um, then you might be able to get away with it as long as they're all written up and they've all been shared with the individual at the time. It tends to become more subjective, the appraisal, than, than, than objective. So um, if you're going to include it, include it amongst lots of other objective criteria rather than having it you know, very small number of, of criteria and an appraisal and a, a supervision is in there. Um, one thing you do get from supervision records is obviously um, things like training and, and number of training courses that they've committed to over the year. You can obviously, if you use online systems, you can add up what they've done online. So there's lots of ways in which you can pad out your criteria. But yes, you can use performance, but I do consider it to be quite subjective. And if, you, if you've got to have it, then have it amongst sitting with other objective criteria. OK, thank you very much. Anyone else? Yeah, can I ask a, a sort of similar question? Um, yeah. Uh, oh, we have um, area managers, we have four, we are going to have to reduce those because they're our most expensive staff. One of our members of staff is has lots of protective um, characteristics, she is registered disabled, um, she has had a lot of sickness, not necessarily because of her disability but because of other medication etc, but she also has some... Um, some disciplinary, we've had to discipline her about some a couple of things, so for would would because of her characteristic protective characteristics would we still be able to put her down as yeah, include yeah. her yeah yeah you would i mean the the um you know the argument could be that any days absent due to the disability ought to be wiped um but again it's not an automatic like it would be if she was pregnant and she was off for a pregnancy related absence it's it's a debatable one um, but if she's if a disciplinary is on there, then again, often disciplinary is the one that we um, that we focus on. And you know, I talked to you earlier about the need to sometimes um, you know put a multiplier on one of the criteria in order for it to give a fair outcome. So you might well put a multiplier on disciplinary if you've got somebody's got a written warning. That might well mean that that rather than getting three points for a written warning, you get six. Yeah. Okay. So, Put the emphasis on that um, and again you know people probably will understand that you're not going to keep people that haven't got a clean disciplinary record are you yeah great thank you very much that's lovely thank you is that everybody sorted Jennifer, hi sorry can i just quickly ask one quick question um, yes leanne of course oh thank you sorry to keep you and um, what it is i run own and manage an out of school club um i have four staff who are currently furloughed and if the furlough does end at the end of May, will I re make all the staff redundant, but then re-employ them come September? Because our schools are talking about not opening until September. Um, so we've, we had to shut on the 23rd of March, 
we currently are getting no income until we then reopen in September, which then means funds won't start coming in until the end of September, beginning of October. I'm really concerned that if the furlough scheme ends at the end of May, what do I do with the girls um, who I obviously will need come September when everything hopefully gets back up and running? But mm. financially, would, would thought, you need to? Would you be? Would that be most of your workforce that you would be making redundant? That would be all of my workforce. Okay. And what would that mean for your business? Is it a limited company? No, so I'm just a sole trader who okay. employs. Yeah. Okay. So as a self-employed person with employees. You, you, need to, you obviously need to follow the same redundancy rules as anyone else. Um, yes, I can see how you would need to obviously make all of your staff redundant. But would that mean obviously a huge outlay to you in the sense of obviously um, redundancy payments and what yeah. have you all yeah. be at the same time? Yes. So what happened was I took over the after school club. So I bought it off a previous owner. So all of my staff are stupid. So they've all got four or more years service. Mm. you're gonna you're, you you've got your contracts with you Leanne do you know if you've got layoff there is no layoff in there the contracts are very very vague from the previous owner well you know what you need to do about those then don't you yes definitely <laughs> we've got a technical bit of a technical Birmingham term coming up but um which is old bugger yeah. um <laughs> think about how we're going to do that I mean you're not going to want to make redundant people and then have an, and lose your business which is in reality what you would be doing because all the liability as a self-employed person is going to be on you mm -hmm. there's no limited company to fold and put into insolvency is there mm -hmm. yeah and unfortunately um, would people agree to be perhaps being unpaid for a period of time even without the clause in order to come back to you in september i guess there might not be other places for them to go to um and they might prefer to keep their job and be able to restart so you remember I did a video back at the beginning of this. Have you, do you follow me on this page and other pages? You know, yeah. video where I've, I've got, I, I look like I've got, I've just had my hair done because I had, um, and I'm sat on a bed looking happy. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that was video when I talked about all is not lost if you don't have lost. Um, if you scroll back through the pages and you'll see that video, that might be your situation, Leanne. You might need to consult with your staff about applying lost um, to a situation that doesn't exist. Um, in their contracts because you will want them back in September and they will want to be able to claim any benefits they're entitled to in this yeah. game when you can't give them work. Yes. Okay. I'll have a look at that. Thank yeah. you. So have much. a look at the video. You'll see me. I look quite smart. <laughs> you always look very good. Of lack. I don't. I hadn't had weeks and weeks of lack of sleep. <laughs> I, looked, I still looked fairly normal by then. It was the beginning of March. Oh, Thank you so much. That's really great help. Thank you, Imogen. You're welcome, Leanne. Anybody else? Imogen, can I just ask mine? Of course you can, Diane. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I have um, a lady that I recruited who was supposed to start on the 1st of April, but obviously she didn't start with me. Yeah. I'm going to have to make probably three practitioners redundant looking yeah. at my forecasting. Can I make three staff redundant but take this girl on because she's so good? Am I allowed to do that? You, you're, going to have, you're going to have pushback from your staff if obviously yeah. that, that vacancy goes through i mean one of the one of the things we took out the presentation was a recruitment freeze now you know you would if, the, if they don't have the skills of doing that job and that's a job that is necessary for you going forward you'll be able to argue that it's necessary but you know if you think about how people perceive things being often more important than yeah, yeah. Fancy, they're definitely going to take some convincing that you have to have her start regardless of the fact yeah. you have tendencies she she was think recruited for a, for a room leader role and the others aren't so that that might be the the way yeah to go. and could they do a room leader role no no do they not have the qualifications they've got the qualifications but not the skill right okay so one option might well be for you to to take the view that, okay she hasn't started yet um, and you will have and you will need a room leader but you won't need as many um practitioners so if it was me i might be tempted to sort of do a process and let them raise their hand for that vacancy with it still being within your power to with, remove her offer if they were successful yeah okay yeah so yeah. that you keep you keep all your your, your spinning plates in the air yeah. No? yeah that's that's great thank you all right wonderful well that was a bit longer than i anticipated then wasn't it ladies and gents um but hopefully useful as i say you definitely need to be thinking about it before you need to do it and that's always the rule regardless of 
um, when a redundancy occurs. You always need to be, you, you're always better off if you've thought about redundancy and thought about how it's going to work before you ever need to, to press the button and use it. Um, and we are here as your friendly HR consultants, should you need any assistance. Remember, you can get our assistance um, as cheaply as obviously just paying for a phone call and or you can join our gang um, and be one of our, our new customers that we are welcoming in before the end of May. And if anyone wants a flowchart, drop us a line and tell us what you want it to look like. We'll do you a flowchart. And James is also taking requests for spreadsheets. So anyone who wants a spreadsheet as well. Not as good as Ian's spreadsheets, but um, he can hold his own, to be fair. Anyway. I'll um, wave you all goodbye and um, get this formatted and uploaded to YouTube so anyone that can watch it that needs it. But um, spread the good word and um, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.